Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. This is Michael Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Careers. And I'm here today to answer any type of cloud computing question and answers you have. For example, perhaps you desire to become a cloud architect, or maybe you desire to become a cloud engineer, or a solution architect, or an enterprise architect. And that's why we're here to help you build your best technology career. So my name is Michael Gibbs, and not only am I the CEO of Go Cloud Careers, I've been an engineer and then an architect now for over 25 years. And I've spent the last two decades helping people get their first tech job or get promoted in tech. And I want to get you cloud hired. Maybe you saw the video with my student this morning, one of my students that got his first cloud architect job. Maybe you've seen several of our videos that of our students that have got our, their first cloud architect job. And by the first two days this week, we already got three people their first cloud architect job. Two of them are actually in their 20s. One was hired by AWS, fresh out of school, no experience. Another one is hired in their 20s by a large global bank, and another one, also not from tech, also got a great job. And we can help you get your first cloud architect job, too. And that's why we're here, to help build your best career. So before we begin, let's talk about some free things we're doing to actually help you build your best career. Please register for the completely free Azure Solution Architect Expert Bootcamp. The link is in the description below. It's completely free, free register. And this is going to be a real live boot camp, the kind of boot camp you would go as if you took a professional course. We'd be there and you'll see the instructor talk live. It's not going to be PowerPoint slides with audio. I'd never do that to anybody unless we had no choice on a technical example. It's going to be live instruction just like this. We'll have 20 minutes of lecture and 10 minutes of questions per hour. And that way we know you get the best experience because that's what we care about is knowing you get the world's greatest experience and you learn. Because my whole goal for all of you is to help you all get cloud hired. What's the point of a certification if you don't learn how things work and why they work? Because that's what it takes to be hired. So please register for the absolutely completely free Azure Solutions Architect Expert Bootcamp. The link is in the description below. This joins our completely free training portfolio of the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate on our YouTube channel, the Cisco Certified Network Associate on our YouTube channel, and the super, super intro to networking, the AWS Advanced networking, which is a good intro to this before the CCNA. And there you go. Now you've got some good networking things, some good uh, cloud things completely free on our channel. Now let's talk about some other free things we're going to do to help you in your cloud architect or solution architect or even cloud engineer career. On the 25th of March, which is a very special day for me because equals Pentamartia or the 25th of March is, March is a big celebration where I'm from in Greece. We're going to have a free mock interview session. And it's going to be on May 20, uh, 25th. Uh, apologies for me messing up the names of my head, but it's going to be a great time. You're going to come. We're going to interview you all. And we will tell you what you need to do to get your first job. We'll tell you if you're ready. We'll tell you if you're not. You'll see what your competition is. And you will learn how to win. And by win, I mean getting cloud hired in your next interview. You're going to know what hiring managers want. And we will tune you and do it all for free. Normally, you charge about $400 an hour for this, but we're going to do it completely free. So... Please join us for the next mock interview session on May 25th. So those are some other things that we're doing. Now, if you desire to become a cloud architect, take our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. We've gotten so many students hired. You can read about it in every possible magazine you can think of at this point. Anything from a, a training mag, to, uh, in, to Information Week, you know, we're, we'll be, be seen on Hacker Noon, we're seen in Big Ninza, we're seen everywhere because everyone everywhere is writing articles about how we're getting so many people their first cloud architect job. So check us out. And if you really want to become a cloud architect, take our cloud architect career development program. My team will pop that in there along with a 20% off coupon code. They'll pop it in the link in the description below. They'll also pop it in the chat box. If you want to get cloud hired, now is your time. Now is your time. And on Thursday, we have our completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. This will be a webinar on Zoom. And because it's on Zoom, I'll present for approximately 45 minutes to an hour. And we'll spend one hour live answering your questions. You'll be able to come off mute and ask questions. And you'll hear other people's questions. And, and we'll tell them how, how to solve their challenges. And you'll learn how to solve your challenges, too. So it's going to be live and great fun. So please join us. But the reason we do these things, these free live question and answer sessions three times a week, is to help you build your best cloud architect career, cloud solution architect career, cloud engineer. So if you want that cloud architect job, solution architect job, cloud engineer job, and you're not sure where to go, ask us some questions. Jamal. 
I'm Mike for networking search. Is a CCN good enough for a generic cloud architect or you need to pursue the CCNP? Jamal, these jobs are not about certification. These jobs are about competency, competency, competency. Now, what is the cloud? The cloud is a network and a data center. So you need network and data center knowledge. Is the CCN enough? Well, I've gotten people hired with zero certifications whatsoever. So yes, the CCNA is enough, but the knowledge contained in the CCNA is not enough. So you know, if you're asking me if a certification is enough, that, yeah, sure. But let's talk about the certification and why we use certifications. Jamal, I wanna make this perfectly clear. In 2022, except for the Cisco Certified Internet Expert and the Cisco Certified Design Expert, there are no certifications that are gonna get anybody a job ever. Now it used to be Jamal, you know, 30 years ago, you had to get a couple of certifications and some employers would have been interested because it made your, your profile look better, but not now. Employers know that most people fake their way through certifications by buying the test on the internet. And we've seen that because we basically look at people that have taken certification. We ask them questions about the material on the certifications and 99% of the people don't know. Now, Jamal, we have to be careful and understand what's in the certification, the CCNA, how to configure network stuff. But cloud architects don't configure anything. So some of the underlying knowledge in the CCNA is good. So here's what you need to know knowledge-wise to be a cloud architect, because it's never a certification thing. Now, the CCNA is enough to get you that interview, which we like, and you need a certification to get an interview, but realize the can information contained in that certification is not enough to get hired. So what does it take for someone to get a cloud architect job, a generic cloud architect job? Well, they need to know networking. And some of this is explained in the CCNA and some of it isn't. The biggest networking protocol that a good cloud architect needs to know is BGP, which is not covered in the CCNA. Now, the reality is the level of BGP in the CCNP is not enough. You need the level of BGP in the CCIE curriculum. And that's why in our cloud architect career development program, we teach that. As it turns about into networking, my CCIE number is 7417. Back when it was a monstrous two-day exam, before the fail rate was so high that Cisco decided to make it easy and take this big complicated two-day exam that everybody failed and turn it into a one-day exam. And that's why there's 60,000 or 80,000 of them as opposed to, you know, when I was at there and, you know, people were taking that test for 10 years and there were only a couple thousand of us. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. So what do you need to know from networking? You need to know the following. BGP, not covered in the CCNA. OSPF to some degree, eh, not really covered in the CCNA either. That's more CCNP, CCI stuff, but you should know that. Now, what, but you don't need the certifications bigger than that. You need the knowledge. What else do you need to know? You need to know WAN protocols, and a lot of this is in there. So in the CCNA, they'll cover IP6 tunnels. In the CCNA, they'll cover um, SSL-based VPNs. In the CCNA, they'll cover Ethernet lines and Ethernet over PLS and serial lines. So that cuts covered in there. Well, they won't cover a software-defined networking and SASE, which are coming really important parts of networking that the cloud architect needs to know, and that's why we teach those things in our course. Additionally, what's not covered in the CCNA you really got to understand IP addressing, subnetting, and supersnetting. And it's covered a little bit in the CCNA, but with regards to route aggregation, route hiring, you need to hiding, you need to know a little bit more than that. And, and that's there. So, but you know, some of that stuff in the CCNA is there. And the CCNA gives you about 60%. The AWS Advanced Networking doesn't give you any of this. So at least, you know, you're on the right track. Now, you need to know VLANs, VLAN tagging, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, et cetera. That is in the CCNA, which is terrific. ARP, proxy, ARP, DNS, DHCP, that kind of thing. That is also in the CCNA. QoS and rate limiting, et cetera, not enough in the CCNA. That's more CCMP, CCI things, but you know, you probably shouldn't end up from a security perspective. It's good to know things like 802.1x and VLANs and private VLANs, et cetera, those other optimizations as well. Now that's on there. Now on the data center side, you really need to understand servers and server virtualization containers and container orchestration. Um, Storage area networks, and I mean you really need to know storage area networks, not like the basic kind of coverage that's in the Certified Solution Architect Professional, the Azure Solution Architect Expert. You need to have real knowledge on storage. So, you know, we teach that, or you could get it from Dell EMC or IBM because they make storage area networks, specifically block storage, object storage, file storage network. After that, what you're going to need to know, and you're going to have to have good, solid understanding of is going to be load balancers and not and the way they work and how to tune them, optimize, stack them because there's lots of load balancer complex architectures. Um, you need to know business applications such as CRM applications, ERP applications, and how organizations use them. 
you need to be pretty good with active directory and how that works. And you also definitely, definitely, definitely need to be aware of the other clouds that are out there like OpenStack and Nutanix. Nutanix, because that's something we're all doing in today's world. Almost everybody has a hybrid cloud or is building a hybrid cloud as they're part of their hybrid cloud, multi-cloud architecture, especially banks. Only 30% of their tech is on the bank. Now, Jamal, because you're talking architecture, you got to remember an architect is not an engineer. And an architect is going to be at that C level, 25% of their time talking to people. That architect is going to spend 50% of their time actually doing presentations and writing documents. And the architect is also going to be entertaining clients and the such. So to get this architect job, you need the archetype of the architect, which is a business executive with a lot of gravitas or executive presence. And if you don't have untrained executive presence, you need it. We train it for that reason. Now you're going to be selling. So what we do as an architect is we design, Jamal, present, and sell. So make sure that you either get some sales skills or you train with us. And we'll give you those sales skills. Now, along with that, Jamal, you've got to have some solid negotiation skills. We teach a combination of Chris Voss's work and the Harvard Negotiation Project. If you're not with us, get some negotiation training. I don't care. I just want to get you hired. Now, because you'll spend so much time at the executive level, specifically with the CEO, the CTO, the CFO, the COO, the CIO, you're going to have to be CXO relevant. And we teach that. But if not, you need CXO relevancy training because, you know, we can't say we can't be telling the CEO about the speeds and feeds of our box. They're not interested in that, but they are interested in what affects top line revenue, net income, EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things that are really interesting to them. And we've got to be relevant to them. Now, we do a lot of responding to RFIs, RFPs, and RFQs, so your executive writing, et cetera. And you're also going to be doing presentations not only to the board, to executives, but also at three to 5,000 person conferences as an architect as well. So make sure your presentation skills are there. So Jamal, when you get interviewed for a cloud architect job, that's what they're looking for. Three quarters of what they're looking for is you have the archetype. Can you walk in there, command the room, and be respected, be trusted, and seen as a trusted advisor and not seen as biased? Like, I like AWS, or I love Azure, and I'm a cloud evangelist, and I'm going to send you to the cloud customer, whether it's good for you or about. They want to know that you looked, you analyzed their business requirements. And Jamal, the level of business acumen, because when a customer says, I want this $300 million technology solution, which they do all the time, then you've got to create the budget for them, which means you've got to show the customer and demonstrate how your technology will improve the sales processes, will decrease cost inside of the organization by enhancing productivity, et cetera. You've got to show that customer where the value is. And the customer will never buy your product or your solution unless your, solu your solution delivers more value to the business than it actually costs. So that's your return on investment capital modeling, which you're going to also have to do. So now you know, Jamal, the skills to get hired as a cloud architect. Note, most of them are not technical and none of it is certification related. And here's why. Jamal, in the certification, they teach you how to configure the VLAN, how to configure your S3 bucket, but architects don't configure, we design. So we need to focus on design, design, design. Hope I answered your question there, Jamal. And please ask some questions. That's why we're here. We want to build your best cloud computing career. And we'll as you have your last round of an AWS interview, I would love to get some tips and hints. Well, I can give you generalities because, you know, there's some proprietary things here. On the last round of AWS interviews for architects, and you didn't say what kind of job you're interested in, for the architects, the last round is give a presentation. Okay. And that, in that presentation, you've got to show executive presence leadership skills, high degrees of emotional intelligence. When you explain the solution, they're looking for you to explain what is the solution, how does it work, and what benefits it has for the customer. Now, as engineers do the following, engineers tell you problem, 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 and an hour into the presentation, they, they get to the solution. As architects are not engineers, so they start with the solution and then provide the substantiating evidence. See, the customer's already aware of the problem. That's why they called you. You don't need to tell them and report the news. Hey, you have this problem, this problem, this problem. They already know. That's why they called you for help. They're looking for that digital transformation special. So give them the solution and then the substantiate evidence as to why you chose that solution versus alternative choices. Now, as on our YouTube channel, we've got a video on Amazon leadership principles. Now, those same leadership principles apply at every single company in the world. Amazon just likes to call them their own. And we made a video on those Amazon leadership principles. Now, as on our YouTube channel, 
we have the following. About 18 videos on showing you how to ace the interview. And I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you watch them. Because we'll show you the way we explain something. What is the tech? How does it work? And why should a company use that? Because that's what we're looking for. As, as an architect, we don't talk speeds and feeds. We don't talk the idiosyncrasies of things. That's engineering. We talk about the what, the how, and the why. So that's something, as that I really want you to focus on. And as I don't know if you're the as that I know in Egypt, but if you are, welcome, and I'm so happy to see you. Now, as normally I would say, you know, take our training program, but you already have this interview. And we do have some interview training, which I would have told you if you started this two weeks ago, our tech interview mastery program, because we are experts, experts, experts to the interview. I've been studying interview tactics and techniques now for 25 years, ever since I wanted to leave internal medicine and move into technology. And I've spent hundreds and thousands of hours perfecting interview techniques and coaching people on interviews. And realistically speaking, as what you got to get across to the customer is the following. The hiring manager is looking for someone that's technically competent. So you've got to prove technical competency in your career, not somebody else's. And that's very important. Meaning if you're an architect, don't talk about your programming knowledge because that's somebody else's career. And in here, when you start talking about your skills and your capabilities, you know, make sure they know that you've got a lot of those relationship things because this is a relationship career. As this is not really the biggest tech career, but employers want the following. They want technically competent. So they show them your competency. As the second thing employers say they want is someone that's honest. So what most people do in an interview is they bluff, which is a lie, and we can never hire anybody that lied to us. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, the next thing that employers are looking for is energetic, enthusiastic people. So show your love for the technology and how it can improve the world and make people's lives better. As the next thing that we're looking for is somebody called an energizer. Who is an energizer? The person that walks in the room. Hi, everybody. How are you? Let me help you with this. Let me help you with this. They're looking for someone that's emotionally intelligent that raises the energy of their room. Because you don't even have to be a good technical person. But if you're the person that walks in the room that makes everybody's output go up by 30%, you're an asset, even if you didn't know how the tech worked in the first place. Now, I'm exaggerating the concept a little bit to prove the point. If I had a team of 10 people and I could bring in a shiny person that could go in there and bring coffee to everybody and make everybody do three times the amount of work, that's the most valuable person in the world. So employers want somebody that can bring out the best in others. Now, two things else that employers are looking for. They're looking for team players as because the reason is architecture is a team sport, meaning somebody's going to come to me with an architecture, a huge one. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at, I'm going to interview the client. And when I get a list of requirements that's this long, I'm going to say, how many people do I need to do this? And I'm going to say, if I'm an architect, a supervisory architect, a cloud network architect, a cloud IM architect, a cloud security architect, a cloud big data architect, a couple of DevOps engineers, some maintenance people, we get them all together and we collaborate on the design. So you've got to be the leader, the manager, and get that because architecture is a team sport and they want to know that. Now, as the last thing people want to know is as follows. Are you willing to go above and beyond? The person that's got the objective on the resume that says what they want, employers don't care. When you go on an interview and ask the hiring manager, what's the work-life balance? The hiring manager's like, it's great. Now, bye. Now, they may be polite in the interview, but they'll never talk to you. So focus your interview like you would do any sales process. Show the customer what you can do for them. Show the customer how you can make their life better. Show the customer how you can transform their business through the use of cloud-based technology, and you will get hired every time, and you'll be paid more than the competition because that's what we do, digital transformation. So make sure they know that your world is loving technology to solve customers' business problems. You're not a hands-on engineer. This is an architecture. You're a business executive who solves people's business problems through the use of technology. Do that, and you should be great, assuming you have the competency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that will be covered in our Tech Interview Mastery Program, which is an amazing program, which costs, literally speaking, half of a single one-hour consult with me, and that's why I created it, to help others build their best tech careers. So, as I hope I answered your question there. Thrilled to have you here. Please answer your questions, and tell me in the chat box where you're from. And Chris, you can go to the next question. Jay Don, will the Azure Bootcamp be recorded for watching? Absolutely. 
you know, if we do things on Zoom, obviously we don't share them because when we do things on Zoom, they're private. But when we do things on YouTube, we do it on YouTube for the following reason. YouTube can scale to huge numbers of people because we get lots of people on these things. But also with YouTube, we can leave the content there forever, forever changing lives for the better, for keeping people that have him buying courses that we don't think are good for them because we're giving it to them for free. It keeps people, you know, they can't afford a course. It gives them an opportunity to take a course. And it's not just going to be like a fake course where it's like PowerPoint slides with audio voiceover. It's going to be a real course. Like if you took a global knowledge course or where they, where it's a good program, but they charge you $5,000 for the week. Those are the kind of courses we do live, real professional instruction. And we'll leave it on YouTube forever because we want to know that you got the best. Now, Jay, we're going to leave that on YouTube until most likely the time we do another version of it a year later, in which case we'll pull the old one and leave the new one there because we want to know that all of you have the best tools to get cloud hired, to get your whatever certifications you need, to get some knowledge base. And we always go more than certification. Now, I'm not going to say we're exactly certification focused training because we're not. We're a cloud hired focused training, but we'll give you the skills you need for the certification, assuming, assuming you also use a practice test but I'll also give you some life skills. So Jay Don, of course, we'll leave it there because that enables us to help us build better lives and better careers for our students. And that's why we are so obsessed with getting everybody hired. I wouldn't do any of this if it wasn't for getting people cloud hired. I love getting people cloud hired. And that's why we do everything that we're describing right here. So hope you're having a great time. Please, please, please ask us some questions. And we want to help you build your best career. And while you're asking questions, do the following. Give us a hashtag that says cloud hired. And also tell us where you're from in the chat box. But if you want to get your first cloud architect job, join our cloud architect career development program. We get people hired every single day of the week all over the world. Today, you can see another video of one of our amazing program participants who's got his first cloud architect job. Manju, ready? Can you get a cloud engineer? Job with a career gap? Of course you can. I've gotten people cloud architect jobs that haven't worked for 10 years. I've gotten people cloud architect jobs that's their first tech job. This week, we got two people that have never worked in their life because they were in college and they just got out of college. And of course, they're doing great. You can do something with a career gap. Now you're going to have to explain the career gap. Sure, you're going to have to explain the career gap, but sure you can. We had a woman in England. She had an eight-year career gap. She came back and she got a great job. And you know what? A month later after she got that job, she got an even better offer. So we, of course you can. I had to take about eight years off from work at one point because I was involved in an accident. Couldn't walk for eight years. Now, I had to work harder to come back, but I came back. So the point is, of course you can, ready? You can do anything you want. And that's the thing. You can do anything you want. People say, Mike, I did this in my past. Can I do this in the future? I'm like, you can do whatever you want. I used to practice internal medicine, woke up and the next job I had was a senior network engineer. A couple months later, I was the lead architect at the world's largest ISP. It doesn't matter. If you want to do something, it's great. Now, I'll tell you this. I mean, if you've been in prison for murder, you know, that might affect your ability to get yourself a job with a career gap. But as long as you've got a clean record and you've treated others well, people take off time. Sometimes people have to take care of sick family members. Raise children, who cares? And the world is forgiving as long as you've got the right skills, the right communication skills, and people can feel you. So of course you can, of course you can, of course you can, of course you can. But what's gonna determine whether you can get that clutter engineer job? One, your technical competency. That's the number one factor. I'm gonna tell you that's 50% of it. Now, what's the other 50% of your ability to get hired? Well. It's your trustworthiness and integrity. It's your knowledge of what you know and what you don't know. How much do you know yourself and your weaknesses so you don't make big mistakes? It's your energy, your enthusiasm. It's your passion. It's your emotional intelligence. It's your communication skills. It's are you a team player? And do they feel that you're willing to work hard? If you do that, of course you'll get hired. And it doesn't matter how much time you've had off as long as there's nothing in your background to scare people away. Like you were on death row for multiple murders, something like that. Yes, that will keep you from getting one with a career gap. But if your career gap is because you were sick, injured, had to take care of family members, raise a child, of course it doesn't matter the world's understanding. So of course you can get a good uh, cloud engineer job with a career gap. I've done it. I've had lots of career gaps. One where I couldn't walk for eight years. 
the world didn't care. I came back and it's fine. But you've got to have communication skills to explain it. Why did you take the time off? And then you'll be okay. So of course you can, of course you can, of course you can. Hello, Mike. How do you carry your new students along during your live sessions for the Cloud Architect program? I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I mean, I don't lift and move people up. Uh, what I do is I train in a training program. I teach a class. I motivate my students to the best of my abilities to continue to do the class. And the students participate in the class. And the students that participate in the class and do the work, they get hired. That's it. Now, people don't show up to class and don't do the work. They're not going to get hired. So, I mean, I don't lift and move people in class, if that's what you're asking. I'm not really sure what the question actually is. But I make the world's greatest training available to my students. Our training program, retail cost of it would be about $50,000. And I make it available for less than $1,000 because I want the world to get cloud hired. Because I don't need the work. And this is basically a charitable mission that my company is doing to make the world a better place. We've got higher cost to run it because we don't have like, this is not PowerPoint slides with audio. I've got three MBAs on staff. Actually, all, four of my people have master's degrees. And I do this because I want to know that my people are given the best concept and training. And my people that don't have master's degrees are smarter than me, believe it or not, and smarter than others. I have the greatest and best people. And I have people that are experts, but I can't make you motivated. If you're not motivated and you're not going to do the work, that's on you. I can provide the training. It's kind of like when I used to practice medicine. You know, I've got, patient, I've got a patient that's got a cardiovascular disease, and I tell that patient, I need you to take this uh, statin for your cholesterol. I need you to stop eating bacon, eggs, and sugar for breakfast and swap it out for oatmeal with maybe some uh, egg whites and some nuts. And, oh, Mr. Patient, I need you to start exercising. I need you to participate in resistance training two to three times per week, as well as aerobic training four times per week and mobility training three times a week. And Mr. Patient, if you do this, you won't have that heart attack. But I can't force the patient to eat right. I can't force that patient to go to the gym and I can't force that patient to take care of themselves or take their medication. So, you know, I don't know what you mean. I don't know how to answer that. I provide the greatest training out there. My students get hired every day. You can see some of the cloud hired videos. And I'm going to bring in uh, some of my 20-year-olds on YouTube recently, that I, someday soon, that I got hired that have never worked in tech before that got great solution architect jobs because they were motivated, 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 and actually did the work. But, but, but I, I don't lift me people and move people, and I don't call people up and say, please come to class, please come to class, please come to class, because we are all responsible for our own success. I give everybody the tools, but you got to take advantage of the tools. So I'd like to remind everybody that we have a completely free Azure Solution Architect Expert Bootcamp in June. It's going to be lots of fun. 20 minutes of training, 10 minutes of questions per hour for at least for about five days straight. It's going to be fun, 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 fun. Lots of people are going to learn, and it's going to be amazing. And Chris, you can bring in the next question. Prem S, you would like to move into cloud audit. Can I do that by being a cloud architect? Prem S, an auditor and architect are two very different careers. An auditor is more like an, a, more like an accountant. That's going to be the person that hides in the background that nobody sees. And that's definitely, definitely not an architect. That's going to be a deep engineering thing. And that is nowhere close to the architect. So the architect, Prem, is an executive, a communicator, a presenter, somebody that's designing to solve customer problems. The utter is like the accountant that you have to pay for legal re regulatory requirements. And this is the math head. This is a log head. This is a legal expert. And they are not an architect. Now, our architect course would give that person the skills to not look like the accountant, the bean counter, giving them emotional intelligence, executive presence, etc. But architecture is design. We design and present and sell. And cloud auditing is the exact opposite. So no, a cloud architect program would not make you an auditor. An auditor training program would make you an auditor. And a cloud engineering program would also not make you an auditor because it's a different career. So Prem, our cloud architect program gets people cloud architect jobs. 
Our cloud engineer program gets people cloud engineer jobs. I don't have a cloud audit program because that's not a career that I think is good for people. It's not a career that I recommend because it's going to be really hard to get, it's going to be really low pay, and it's going to be a ton, a ton, a ton of work. And for people that like that back end work, it's great. It's terrific, but that's not my skill set. My skill set is solving customer problems through the use of technology. I also studied finance. I hate accounting. Accounting, in my MBA, I had to study accounting in addition to finance. Finance was great. Finance was the time value of money and showing customers how to make better decisions and make them rich. I love that. It's the same thing as architecture. Accounting is after the money's been spent, trying to figure out which, where the pennies and things went to make sure everything balances in the checkbook. And that is so not me. Uh, we focus on the highest paying, most critical careers that go cloud careers. That way we say we only focus on elite cloud computing careers. That's not a career that we have anything to do with because that's not our world. We either make people learn, teach people how to solve customer problems, or we teach people how to build systems. So cloud architects cloud, and cloud engineers, they're great careers. This is not a career that we, we would teach. This is not a career that we know anything about. And this is one of those people that we hire and say, hey, I need somebody there, but it's not somebody the company is excited about hiring. So realize the career potential with that is going to be very, very, very low because nobody wants to hire these people. We have no choice but to hire these people for legal purposes, HIPAA compliance, PCI DSS compliance, et cetera, et cetera. So none of us want them. And because we have to hire these people in the back end to stay legally compliant, and we all do it, the company will see this person as an expense, as someone that they really doesn't bring profitability to the company. So this is not going to be anybody's favorite position. This is a position where if you understand it, the world is going to be, you're going to be in the basement and nobody's going to be nice to you. So understand all of those things. And that's why we don't train it. But there are people that love back end bean counting. And if you were an accountant in your last life, this would be a good career for you. If you were a lawyer in your last life, but you didn't like to go to court because you didn't want to talk in a courtroom, this is a great job. So it's all about personality type. And I'm all about matching your career with your personality type. I can't teach bean counting because that's not my personality type. And at Glowco Careers Prime, we only teach what we're experts on. If I teach a cloud architect job course, I know they're all everybody that takes it and does the work is going to get hired. When we teach a cloud engineering course, we're pretty sure that everybody takes that course is getting hired. But I can't teach courses where I'm not sure. I can't teach these courses where I'm not an expert. We're not a certification company where I'm going to learn a certification and tomorrow teach it. We only teach things for which we have 20 plus years of experience because all of our students are there. So now you know the good and the bad of that, uh, of that, of that career. Now you know the kind of background that would do well with it. That accountant or the lawyer, not the trial lawyer, the one that wants to be in the back, in the back, in the back. So. I know people that love that. My sister's a lawyer that likes to do back-end stuff, and good for her. I've got a friend that's an accountant, and when he describes what he does to me, it scares me because it's all this stuff. But for me, it's not me, but I love finance. Worked in Wall Street for a little while, too, because I love the way, the time value of money, and what you can do with things, and it's all great. So do what you love, and you'll always be happy. But no, architecture is not going to build that. Cloud engineering is not going to build that. You're going to need some special bean counting courses that are good for that, and that's not something we do. But I love the question. And I like to provide things. I like to give the whole perspective of the career so you can make an affordable decision. And here's why I do that. Lots of times somebody says, do this, it's good. And if it's what you love, it's great. But if it's not, you know, that's okay too. And I want you to get all the things so you can make your best career decisions. So you can have, guess what? Your best cloud computing career. Prem, thanks for the question. And please feel free to ask another one. Now you have our first initial guidance. Prem, how much coding is required for a cloud architect role? Zero. Prem, cloud architects design, present, and sell. Say it with me. Design, present, and sell. Prem, the business of the cloud architect is as follows. I go to a customer site. I ask the executives about their business. I take their business things that they're telling me at the executive level. I then translate them into technology requirements. I figure out the tech that I can do. I design that tech, and then I hand it over to a team of cloud engineers to go build it. So Prem, the cloud architect, designs, presents, and sells. This is an executive position. This position needs extreme CXO relevancy, 
sales skills, presentation skills, emotional intelligence, business acumen, like ROI modeling, knowing what to say to the CFO, CTO, CIO, knowing what to say to an intuitive leader like me versus an analytical leader like Chris on the other end, my chief operating officer versus a functional leader that's process oriented like your typical PM. There's all those types out there. You'll need to know how to pivot for the, for the visual, auditory, kinesthetic audience. You will need to know how to show the customer that that billion dollar architecture you're working on is going to be mitigated by the $3 billion of business value, which means you need to understand their business, read their financial statements, read their balance sheets, et cetera. And then premise about your ability to design the systems, which means your understanding of networking and data center technologies, but we never touch the tech. And I don't know why, but for some reason, people think engineers, architects actually touch the tech. The architect role is just like the building architect. You got a building architect that designs a thousand meter tall building, lush waterfalls, lush gardens, but they don't use a hammer and build it. They don't mow the lawn. They don't use a saw. They don't build it. They hire a construction crew. Well, premise the same thing for cloud architects. We design it. And because we don't touch the tech, we don't configure, we don't code, we don't do anything with tech. We design the tech, but we don't build it. So. Now you know, no coding, no configuring, a completely hands-off job. Now, Prem, you'll be taking clients to lunch constantly. You'll be entertaining your clients. You'll be responding to RFIs, RFPs, RFQs, but no, 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 you will never do any coding. I've been an architect for 25 years. I wouldn't know how to code because I'm an architect. I am not a software engineer. Great question, Prem. Before we get to the next one, please join us for the free Azure Solution Architect Expert Boot Camp in June. It's going to be a ton of fun. The registration link is in the chat box and the description below. Also, I'm learning how to do YouTube. So if you're having a good time, if you can hit the like button, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and you'll be informed of all the new free stuff we do when we do it. And also, while you're at it, Register for the next free interview session on May 25th. It's going to be a great time. We'll tell you if you're ready to get hired. You can use this as a practice interview. We normally charge $400 for a one-hour interview session, but we're going to do in many interview sessions completely free. Sign up for the mock interview session. The link is in the chat box and the description below. And while we're at it, join us on Thursday for the free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. We'll go over the Cloud Architect role in depth. We'll tell you what the hiring managers want. We'll tell you how to leverage your life experience to get your first cloud architect job. And I said life experience and past career experience, even if they're different careers, will show you how to create the connections for the hiring manager so you're never not experienced. We'll tell you exactly what needs to be on your resume. We'll tell you how to skip HR so you don't get auto-rejected so you can get hired, get cloud hired, and get that first cloud architect job like our students get their first cloud architect jobs every single day of the week. So join us on the completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. And Chris, bring in the next question. Would being a program manager be beneficial to a solution architect? King, being a solution architect is beneficial to being a solution architect. Now, we do a lot of program managers in our career, but I say this every day. I'm going to make a LinkedIn post on it. Train for your job and not somebody else's. I'm going to make a video about it. Train for your job and somebody else's. So, King, if you wanted to be an airline pilot, would you go to law school? Of course not. If you wanted to be a doctor, would you become an airplane pilot? Of course not. So if you want to become a solutions architect, train to be a solutions architect, not a program manager. Now, if you're asking me about a program manager career, would it be helpful to being a solution architect in the future? Any career can be. So for example, let's say you were a nurse in your last life. A nurse and their career has to diffuse challenging situations. A nurse gets yelled at by the patients, their family members, et cetera, and the hospital staff. The nurse has to make split-second decisions to save lives. I'm just giving you three examples. A nurse has to have extraordinarily good communication skills or errors occur and people die. So we've got an architect that needs high levels of emotional intelligence, high levels of split-second thinking, and attention to detail. Wow, that nursing career would be great. Now, a program manager, if someone used to be a program manager, are also good. What comes out of being a program manager? Well, being able to coordinate a large number of tasks that a lot of people do. In King, when we're doing proof of concepts, we don't touch the tech, our cloud engineers do. So 
you know, when you're doing a proof of concept, you know, having the ability to go out there and manage the 30 people in the team and their test is great. But having said that, King, you know, program managers aren't typically like line managers. Project managers are typically rough around the edges. You do this now. This needs to come in Thursday. I need this. And King, that's a critical skill in the project manager world, program manager world. But in architecture, we're going to need to convince people to work for us that don't work for us. Kind of like in the movie in Buck Tom Sawyer and the movie Tom Sawyer, where uh, by, written by Mark Twain, where the guy wanted to get his friends to help paint, paint his faint pants white with him. So he convinced all his friends to help do him, made it like a party. Well, King, we're going to have to go to our companies and convince the executives to loan us people. And then we've got to convince these people that don't work for us to do the work for us. And that's much more executive skills than program manager skills. So yes, King, leadership skills are great. Communication skills are great. Program manager skills are great. But don't become a program manager to become a solution architect. Become a solution architect, become a solution architect. Now, King, I get a lot of people solution architect jobs, and I never recommend trying to become a solution architect. I always recommend becoming cloud architect, and here's the difference. A solution architect does the following. Only knows one vendor's services. Now, I've got a lot of people hired by AWS, and by AWS, they're a solution architect. And my students get hired by Azure, they're a solution architect. But guess what? Companies want cloud architects, which is an architect that knows Azure, AWS, Google, OpenStack, Nutanix. And that's why we train cloud architects, because a cloud architect can work anywhere, anytime. But a solution architect can only work for one company or one cloud. And at this point, 87% of customers are multi-cloud, and 97% claim to be within the next 12 months. So the solution architect career is dead. The cloud architect career is born. And that's why we teach the cloud, not any vendors of the cloud. We also, And that way you can work on any cloud. And that's why AWS hires so many of our people. But that's why the consulting companies hire so many of our people. And the big banks hire so many of our people. And big enterprises, because we teach them to be a cloud architect. So what are the skills to be bad there? Train system design. Network design, data center design, executive presence, communication skills, ROI modeling, leadership skills. Being great at responding to RFIs, RFPs, RFQs, speaking at 5,000 person conferences, being able to show the customer that the $2 billion solution is worth $3 billion, being able to analyze the customer's business and show them how and why. They are the skills that are beneficial to being a solution architect. Train for your career and not somebody else's and you'll have a great career. Focus on getting certifications outside of your career. The hiring manager is going to say, who the heck is this? I don't need a program manager. I need a cloud architect. So train for your job. You wouldn't go, you wouldn't go to the doctor who was wearing an airline pilot suit and be comfortable with them and say, hey, I used to be a pilot, but today I'm a doctor. Train for your job and not somebody else's, and you're going to do great. Robert Welch, cloud hired over there in Dallas. ET, cloud hired in the USA. Elvis, it's so good to see you today. Daniel Meacher, wonderful to see you, cloud hire. Daniel Meacher, is there a difference between a security architect and a cloud security architect these days? No, since almost all customer stuff is on the cloud, a security architect does it all. So I wouldn't, I'd focus to be a security architect. Now, a security architect still needs to know the cloud. So today, a network engineer is the same as a cloud network engineer. And uh, for the most part, the security architect is the same as the cloud. So that's a security architect, someone that knows everything. Well, that's a cloudy security architect, someone that knows the cloud. So when I train cloud security architects, I train them to be security architects and not cloud security architects. I still teach them the cloud because they need the cloud. But if you don't know security, you're not a cloud security architect. And that's why silly, trivial nonsense like the AWS advanced security, which isn't even an intro to an intro to an intro to an intro to junior level security is not enough. You need to be a security architect. And that means understanding security policies, how to write them, understanding threats, the type of threats that are out there, understanding the types of mitigations to these threats, next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, et cetera understanding machine learning based adaptive security, event driven security, all these kind of things. This is what we do. Now this is training users to not, to not fall succumb to phishing scams or social engineering scams. This is determining what the identity and access management policies can be. This is looking into things like zero trust. This is looking into rate limiting of your systems on the network and I could go on and go on and go on. 
The same things that a cloud security arch a security architect does, the cloud security architect does. Here's why. Everything's on the cloud now. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You got more opportunities as a security architect because you can work out of the data center and in the cloud. So be a security architect that also knows that's an expert on cloud, and then you can work anywhere, anytime, and you'll get a much better salary because everything's on the cloud these days. So a network engineer is now working on the cloud. They didn't need special training. That's why AWS hired so many CCIEs with no cloud experience whatsoever because they need real networking people to make the network work. So same thing, Daniel. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. Cloud hired, Marcus. This is a follow-up to the question about how do you carry your students? Okay, how do our students catch up? We don't have that problem. Here's the thing. So I train our students the way doctors are trained and the way martial artists are trained. Why is that? Because I come from Madison. I've got 25 years of martial arts. So in our course, 100% of the course that you do on your own is self-paced. So lesson one, do it, turn it in, get feedback from my team. Lesson two, do that, turn it in, get feedback from my team, et cetera, et cetera, for the full 500 hours of training. Now, when I teach a class, like today's class is going to be APIs. I'm not a programmer, so I have a really good application architect talking about APIs. When he discusses APIs, there's no intro to APIs needed. It's going to, we're going to start from the beginning and work our way to the top. And everybody in the class is going to learn about APIs because our live classes are independent of these things. Now, normally on Friday, we do leadership skills for architects. Leadership skills are the same. And we rotate our courses. So here's the way we do it. Because we want everybody to learn, we can't separate new students. And doing batches really hurts the student learning process. So here's why. Right now, we've got an architect class. And in the architect class, I've got people that are ready to graduate. And what does that mean? They're going to get hired soon. I've got some people that have been with me for like a month or two, and they're, they're learning. And I've got some people that just signed up today. So in today's class, the people that signed up while I was sleeping are going to be in that first class, and they are going to observe and learn. The senior students are going to, le or are going to lead the architectural design. The mid students are going to help the senior students, and the new students are going to observe. And then a couple weeks later, guess what? The senior students are all cloud hired, which I love. Brings tears to my eyes every time. Those people that have been in the program for two to three months are now the senior students. And they're working there until they are cloud hired. Those new junior students move up to the media students. And now after they observed and learned, they're there and they're helping the senior students. Poof, those senior students are now cloud hired. Those junior students are now the senior students. And that way, everybody gets a chance to observe, help, and lead, just like the reality. And why do we do that? Because in real life as an architect, you're going to be teaching others. It's half of your job. You can be explaining technology. It's half of your job. So by doing it this way, I know everybody gets a chance to collaborate. But why else do we not do batches? Why do I think batches are the worst idea in the world? So let's say I run a batch tomorrow and I, and I charge $30,000 for the batch like my competitors would do. Now I've got a batch of people that have no knowledge whatsoever. They're brand new. Now I've got a bunch of newbies trying to interact with newbies, and neither one doesn't even know what they don't know. But by doing what doctors do, and martial artists do, where you mix people together, see that good things happen. But it's not just that. So now, you now know my junior students and senior students. My senior students get, get hired, and you made friends with them. And now they drag you with them onto their job. So I intentionally don't do batches, because I've got a communication and a collaboration team that's like nothing. One of my students got hired by a big bank, and he just dragged another one of my students with him for a great cloud architect job. That's why I do it. That's why we don't have anything to worry about catching up because the training you do on your own, guess what, is self-paced. The projects you do on your own is self-paced and architect classes don't stand alone. If I design an architecture for bank once a week, once a month, every student does the bank architecture. We do a hospital architecture once a month, for example. And that way, every student knows how to do every architecture everywhere, every time. So hope I answered your question there. And that's why our process works because I modeled it after what I learned in 25 years of martial arts. And what I learned when I learned how to take care of sick people for my internal medicine career. That's why our students get cloud hired every day. And that's why the batch process doesn't work so much. And it gets super expensive because companies advertise it. They charge their customers 30 times more than what we do. And we get our students hired. And I take the people that take those $35,000 programs, put them through my programs. So they're not getting hired through their programs. And we get them hired too. And we've got lots of examples. 
We also take people from these uh, master's degrees programs where people learn cloud computing. We teach them cloud computing, we get them hired too, because there's a difference between the way architects learn and what's taught in schools. What's taught in schools is tech training, which is engineering or admin, architecture work is design. Marcus. Mike might have been yesterday to stay focused on the main goal of a cloud architect course instead of getting distracted by jumping into engineering. Good. Stay focused and become an expert. That's right. My students ask me all the time, my architects, hey, should I buy your engineering course? And I say, no. And they say, why don't you want me to buy more stuff from you, Mike? And I say, train for your career and not somebody else's, and then you're going to have the best career. So thanks so much, Marcus, and I'm so happy you're here. One of those days. Mike, does cloud computing cybersecurity for cloud security or information management group go better with your course? Starting your class next week and school next month. One of these days, I hate to say this, I don't believe in computer science degrees or computer degrees or information management degrees at all. And here's the reason. What they teach in these programs is going to be coding and all the other things that are so far away that we do from architecture. My favorite degree is a business degree and then an MBA. So one of those days, here's my degrees. I've got a bachelor's degree in nursing, a master's degree in nursing as a nurse practitioner and an MBA. And here's the thing. When my students say, Mike, I want to get a master's degree in technology. What do you think? I say, skip it and do an MBA instead. So one of these days, I want you to think about the critical skills for the architect. So network design, which is not taught in any university in this country, and security, which is not as network design and data center design. None of that is really taught in universities. When I get students with a master's degree of cybersecurity, they don't know anything about security, but they're educated. They know how to write, which is good. So I love that. But they don't have the skills. So I have to start people with master's degrees in tech at ground zero. And in many cases, they're worse off than the people that didn't study tech in school either because of what they were learned is that. And I'll give you an example one of these days. When I did my MBA, it was at a university, and I love universities, but I was at a university, and they wanted me to turn in a technology project that was good. Now, I was working on a tra digital transformation project for one of the world's greatest, biggest banks and greatest banks. The bank bought my technology solution, and it was the foundation for banking and technology. So in the class, we were designed to talk about an innovative technology solution. I presented my design for the class. The teacher came back with an F on it and said, stop talking about science fiction, Mike. And I said, I just designed this for one of the world's largest banks. And the professor said, it's science fiction. And I was like, okay. I actually called the dean and the dean said, Mike, that professor won't be here next year. Would you like to teach the course next semester for the university? <laughs> and you've got a choice. You can fight through that class or you could take it from somebody else and teach it next semester. Which would you like? So there's that. So one of these days, what are the skills you really need to learn for an architecture group? Soft skills, business acumen, emotional intelligence, leadership skills, financial modeling, executive presence, ROI modeling, CXO relevancy, sales, executive writing, not engineering writing, executive writing, et cetera. So if I had a choice to advise you, I'd tell you to get a business degree and take my course. And in my course, we teach you the tech skills, the sales skills, the presentation skills, and in school, you'd learn the business skills. And after that business degree, I'd get an MBA. And that way, when everybody else is out there focused on getting their master's degree in technology to get to $140,000 or $150,000 a year, your MBA will take you to a $300,000 job. So you got two things that you're getting for one of these days, high value targets and low value targets. Your IQ or your, emo your intelligence quotient or your tech skills only gets you so, so far. The impact you make on your customer can get you a lot further. So i give you the example from my life. Thankfully, I have no degrees in tech. All my degrees are in medicine or business. And I wasn't bombarded with all these things because that way, whatever I learned was exactly career specific. So one of these days when I was young, really young, like 25, 26, my manager pulled me out of a room. My manager says to me, hey, Mike, do you know the difference between a $150,000 engineer and a $300,000 architect? And this is 20 years ago. Like, tell me, tell me, tell me. My manager says, look, your tech skills, you've maxed out. You're a CCIE, you're a CISSP. You've got 18 million CCDPs and an MCSA. Stop, Mike. Your technical skills don't get you anymore. 
He said, you speak well, you write well, but if we can make you better at these things, you'll be that architect. And guess what? The impact you'll make on your customers and the impact you'll make on our business will be so much greater. Would you like training? And that's when I did my MBA. And I additionally, between the MBA and with all the soft skills and leadership and business acumen and CXO relevance of training, it was about a quarter million dollars of training that I took. If I told you that it paid for itself in about a year, that extra training, and why? Because it was not tech. It was business leadership skills. So if you were really going to ask, I'd tell you to get a business degree, skip the technology degrees. We don't teach technology properly anyway. You're going to get stuff that's 20 and 30 years old that's not going to be relevant. You do the business thing. You learn how to design, present, sell, solve customer problems, deal with customer service, and that will maximize career. That's what I would do. But then again, I use healthcare degrees, and I, I love them because they teach so much communication skills. In fact, you know the biggest predictor of your long-term career success in all careers? The biggest statistical predictor, it's your level of emotional intelligence. Who has the best training in emotional intelligence? Healthcare providers. That's why healthcare providers like me leave out tech. Healthcare go into tech and we get hired instantly. So train the skills that matter. Train your emotional intelligence, your business acumen, leadership, your skills, and you will have a career, a career that's going to do this versus this. So that's my recommendation. But one of these days, train what you like, do what you love because you want to be happy. But that's the way I treated my career. I don't have any degrees in tech that I have spent lots of time on business acumen, and that's what capitalized my career and maximized it. Nelly, hi, Mike. My LinkedIn account has only 20 connections, which are, which are not related to cloud architect. Will that be a problem? No. Here's what's going to be a problem to hiring managers. Are you technically competent? Are you emotionally intelligent? Can you sell? Can you present? Are you CXO relevant? Do you have the skill and the technical competency? Is your attitude good? Can they trust you? These are the things that matter. Those are the things that matter. So um, those are the things. LinkedIn, no, that doesn't matter. People don't, it doesn't matter. Now I would and tell you, you need to build a good LinkedIn account. And as part of our cloud architect career development program, even our cloud engineering career development program, we do help our students build good LinkedIn profiles. And here's why. My average student gets 10 to 15 recruiters that reach out to them every day after we tune the LinkedIn profile. So I don't need you to have a million connections. That's easy to find them. All I need you to have is the ability to build up your profile that shows that it's good and we can teach you what to post like we do to all of our students. And that's why our students get you know, 10 to 15 interview requests per day. Now, I have my students reject the interview request until they're ready because don't go on an interview that you're not ready for. But because you don't want to go on an interview you're not ready for because the things happen. You won't get hired. You'll burn the bridge with the company, and it'll psychologically affect you. So nobody should ever go more than three interviews to get hired. None of my students have to. And here's the reason why. If anybody has ever been on more than three interviews and they have been hired, there's a problem with the candidate. It's either attitude, their competency, or their communication skills. And instead of burning a bunch of bridges, we should do that. I'm going to tell you I've been on five interviews in my life. I've gotten hired by all five companies because I've studied interviews for 25 years, and that's what we do. So, Nelly, it doesn't matter if your LinkedIn account, build it up. About a year and a half ago, I didn't use LinkedIn. I had no social media accounts because that's not me. I had 150 people on my LinkedIn account. And you know who they were? CEOs and senior vice presidents and executive vice presidents of companies. This year, got 10,000 in my, in my personal, about 4,000 in my business, and it just came from posting quality content. But you know what? You don't need a following like mine. You just need good quality content and the perfect profile for the world to come see you. And you need some people that know you and trust you to write some things about you. So we could train you. We could fix it. But no, it's not about your social media presence. It's about are you technically competent? Can the employer trust you? Do you, do you know what you know and know what you don't know so you don't make dangerous decisions? Are you emotionally intelligent? Do you bring, are you energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate? Are you willing to go above and beyond, and are you a team player? Those are the things the LAP and players want. Do those. Don't worry about so much about your LinkedIn profile but connections, but make it look good. And we'll teach you how to do it if you're part of our program because it's very critical to have a proper resume. And LinkedIn is your normal resume these days. Chris, if you want to go to the next one. Naga, 
How would we aware learn well architected frameworks? Cloud services are changing time to tone. How is an architect okay? So now I've got, I'm not completely sure I understand this. I'm going to try and translate this. Chris, if you can help me try and translate this as well. Okay, so now I've got, I'm going to tell you this. The cloud services are not changing, and they're identical to the same services in 90% that they were 35 years ago. So now I've got, there used to be a song. Only the names have changed yesterday as it was a Bon Jovi song. Like the Who song, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, Anaga. Virtualization, which is basically the technology that makes the cloud possible, is from 1970s when IBM decided to virtualize their mainframe computer. Then in the 80s, in the late 80s and 90s, Cisco created the virtual LAN, which is the foundation for the virtual machine. About 20, 20 years ago, Cisco created the private VLAN, which was a VLAN where people couldn't talk to each other. Guess what? That's now the container. Load balancers, I've been using them from F5 for 20 years. I've been using block storage and object storage and file storage for decades. I've been using firewalls and VPN concentrators for about 25 years. Everything we do in the cloud is 30 to 40 year old technology. Now, Naga, if you don't know the technology, it's new. For example, last year produced the most exciting press release I've ever seen. We now allow east-west routing. And I read this and I went, wait, Cisco was doing that in 1985. You know, this is a press release. And all the network architects that I knew from Cisco all looked at this and laughed and they said, they're taking credit for 40 year old technology. Wow. So the only thing that's different is there. So Naga, you know, well-architected frameworks are not how you design your systems. You design your systems to solve customer problems. Your customer's business designs a technology solution. One of these proprietary well-architected frameworks that locks you into a single cloud provider is not what you design for a customer. So you need to know the cloud versus any specific vendor's cloud. Because if I were to try and teach you to drive a car, you've got two options. Do you learn to drive, which is what we do, or do you learn a bunch of stupid names of the services and then not know what it means in the end? So as following, I could teach you to drive a car and I could teach you this thing is an elastic rotational vector angular device. I could then take you to the Google Cloud and just say this is a cloud-based um, uh, vector. Um, uh, let's see, directional angular Miller radian changer. And then you'd be lost. But if I said, hey, Naga, this is a steering wheel, and here's how you drive a car. So if I taught you what a virtual machine is, and you built a virtual machine properly in VMware ESXi, and then I told you that that was the same thing as an EC2 instance, the same thing that VMware had for 30 years, and it's the same thing as a compute engine instance on Google, and guess what? It's the same thing as an Azure virtual machine or an Oracle virtual machine, the same thing in Nutanix is a virtual machine or OpenStack is a virtual machine. Guess what? Now you know the cloud. And guess what? It's the same tech as it is 30 years ago. So no cloud services are not changing time to time. They're the same things they've been for the longest time. The implementation of these services changed, but the tech has changed, is not changed. And for we architects, it's the same thing. Not good. That's why CCIEs get cloud architect jobs with no certifications or nothing in cloud because we've been designing the same thing for 30 years. So how do you learn? We teach you how to design. And the design starts with the customer. The customer says, I have this business problem. We as the architect translate that business problem to an end optimal state. The state includes workflow, et cetera. Then we determine what technology can do it. And then after we learn the technology, then we figure out the silly names of the vendors to discern it. So it's the same thing now if I was going to design a house. If a building architect designs a house, the house needs to be, let's say it's in Florida, it needs cinder blocks to be filled with concrete and steel because they get hurricanes. Well, the architect would then hire the construction crew and the construction school say, where can I buy cinder blocks? They could make cinder blocks with cement. They could go to Home Depot and buy cinder blocks. They can go to Lowe's and buy cinder blocks. They could go to Ace Hardware and buy cinder blocks. Guess what? We need cinder blocks. Who cares? So there aren't a thing that we need to worry about. Now, Naga, you are also correct in one way. The cloud providers do have these proprietary services that change all the time, like DynamoDB. But Naga... 87% of customers demand a multi-cloud environment, and 97% of them plan to be multi-cloud by the end of the year, in 12 months, which means all those proprietary services, we can't use them anyway. So no DynamoDB, no Amazon Aurora, no Kinesis, no SQS. Now we've got things like MongoDB or Apache Cassandra that work across all clouds. We've got Kafka, which works across all clouds. 
So there are things that we can use. So Naga, it's very simple. If we if we were an architect that could design a network and data center thing, we can design any cloud thing anywhere and anytime. So nothing has changed in the last 40 years. The names have changed in the last 40 years. And the people that have strong foundations know how to keep up with every change because it's only a reiteration of the same thing. It's kind of like doctors. New drug every week. Okay, it's a calcium channel blocker. Okay, I know how it works. Get the fundamentals down and you'll always be up to date. Jay, are we still planning to infuse some of the things? Jay, we keep our architect and engineer courses separate. We are thinking of ways to create either a special course that would enable the sharing or find a way to do it because I don't want my architects focused on engineering. If they do, they won't get hired. Now, there is a subset of those engineering things that are good, and we're trying to see, could we add it without pe getting people off of the architect work? Because the worst thing we can do for the architect is make them too technical, and then they don't get hired. So we're contemplating how and what we could add to make it better, but we don't want to derail the process of getting the architects hired as architects, which is really, really, really important to us. Hi, Mike. I just joined, so my apologies. This was already asked. How does someone get started learning cloud security to be able to get a job? Karu, 747, I want to ask your question, but I need to know the following. Do you want to design security or do you want to build security? When you want to do security, do you want to be a defender, defensive security, or do you want to be a hacker that breaks into systems that gets paid by companies to break into systems, which is called defensive security? And the career path for all of these is exactly opposite. So tell me if I'm going to be an architect where you design it versus an engineer where you build it and versus when you want to defend and protect or whether you want to be offensive and attack into things. You tell me that and then I can answer your question. If I don't have that information, it's going to be incorrect because they're all different careers. VNHG, what's the most different, difficult part of running your cloud career program? I think the most challenging part VNHG is because we've gotten so many people hired and there's just so many people we've gotten hired and I love it that the world has taken notice as more and more and more magazines have reached out to me and written about us and more and more people have found out how many people I get hired. I get about a thousand requests a day for people that want to speak to me. And unfortunately I can't do it. I tried speaking to people one-on-one -on -one for a little while and I was sick for about a month where I could barely talk. So VNHG, the hardest thing for me is when interview requests, but people that reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, Mike, I want to pick your brain. And I say, I can't. If you want to book a private consult, you can do it here. And the reality is, even with what we charge for the private consult, the demand for them is so high that I can't even do half of them. So I try to bring as many people as I can in these free sessions so I can answer people's questions because I'd like to answer the world. The problem is I already work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and I just don't have any more time. I can't give up sleeping anymore. So... The most difficult part is all the people that would like free help that I just can't help. So that's really that. I'd say the other most difficult part is as follows. You know, we get our students hired every single day, but there's these certification people that keep forcing people to get certification, 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 certification. And in the process, the people become unemployable because they look like a certification junkie and they don't look like an architect. And they build the wrong brand. And then I have to remove the people's certifications if they're the wrong ones and rebrand their entire resume. So I'd say that's the most difficult part is trying to take, teach people that, you know, nobody gets a quarter of a million dollar job a year by doing a couple certifications. That it takes knowledge and executive presence and business acumen and design skills. And it can't be done in certification. And truth be told, our program is worth about 50000 but we only charge about a day's pay for the average graduate for this reason. So many people have wasted so many years doing certification training and can't get to their goals, and it breaks my heart. I mean, it truly breaks my heart. I mean, that's why we do all these free boot camps completely free. So we can advise people along the way. We can teach the actual skills along the way as opposed to the name of the service and how to configure those things because that's not what we do. So that's the hardest part for me is wishing I could help more people out there that I don't have the time for and, you know, making sure people stay focused on the career and not the certification.
Okay, Chris, 747, you said you want to defend, but you didn't tell me if you want to be the person that does the defense or you want to be the person that designs the defense. So do you want to be behind the computer or do you want to be the person that designs it? You tell me that and then I can tell you, because again, exactly opposite career paths between the engineer and the architect. Security architects design, engineers build. Yeah. We can answer Naga's vendor question very easily next. To choose the right vendor. Okay, here's the thing, Naga. All clouds are the same. So, here, I've got a flashlight. This flashlight costs $180 at Amazon. This flashlight costs $200 at the sporting goods store and 50 bucks at Home Depot. Home Depot is the right place to buy this flashlight. So, all the services are the same. A virtual machine in every cloud is identical. Object storage in every cloud is identical. File storage in every cloud is identical. So, which store do you go to? Which one do you like? Which one do you trust and which gives you the best price? They're all the same. There's nothing I can't do on Google that I can't do on Amazon that I can't do on Azure. Now, certain claims, claims may be a little better, for example, but that's common sense. If you were going to do machine learning and you didn't want to do it in your data center and you didn't want to do the normal libraries, you might say, who's the best machine learning person? And then you might think about it as an architect and say, well, Microsoft's got lots of algorithms. Mm -hmm. Amazon's not really the algorithm people. Who is? Google, number one search engine in the world. Google, number two search engine in the world. Guess what? YouTube. So I might think Google would be the people I'd go to. But the reality is I could do it on Amazon, Azure, Oracle, Nutanix, OpenStack. It doesn't matter. So who gives you the best price? Who do you like the most and who's nicest to you? It's all the same. All these clouds are identical. And if you know the cloud, not a cloud, but if you know that cloud, you'll know which one to use all the time. Because guess what? If I tell you you need a virtual machine, does it matter if it's called Compute Engine, EC2, or Azure Virtual Machine, or Oracle Virtual Machine? Of course not. If I told you pizza, you know what it was. So get rid of the stupid names and let's go to the things that matter. Design the defense. Okay, Cairo 747, so you would like to be a cloud security architect. So here's what you need to learn. First, you need to know the cloud, which means networking, such as BGP, OSPF, VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, IPsec tunnels, SSL VPN, software defined networking. Ethernet over MPLS, Ethernet private lines. So on the switching side, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking protocols. Port aggregation, ether channel, uh, link aggregation groups, et cetera. NAT, one-to-one uh, -one NAT, one-to-many NAT, static NAT, dynamic NAT, PAT, for example. DNS, DHP, ARP, proxy ARP, et cetera. Then in the data center technologies you're going to need to learn, which include Servers and server virtualizations, containers and container orchestration. Storage area networks, block storage, object storage, file storage. Then you're going to learn uh, and necessarily need to learn, you know, databases, the way they work. Then you will need to know a lot. I mean, a few thousand pages of reading of firewalls, next generation firewalls, because you won't be using these cloud native security services, the cloud security architect. That means, you know, learning about Cisco, next generation firewalls, Palo Alto, next generation firewalls, Fortinet, next generation firewalls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Checkpoint, next generation firewalls, et cetera, et cetera. Then, after that, what you need to learn is, you know, how to write a secure, how to design a security policy, the type of uh, anti-social engineering training. You need to learn about physical security. You need to learn about network security. You need to learn about adaptive and event-driven security. You need to learn about identity and access management, federated identity and access management, uh, single sign-on, multi-factor authentication kind of things, et cetera. You will need to learn about operating systems and their operating system vulnerabilities, how to patch these systems, the kind of anti-malware protection that should be there, what kind of services need to be disabled. You will need to know a lot about encryption technologies, et cetera. Now, there's, much more, there's more than that on the security side, but that's the majority. If you're competent in that, you can get hired. But remember, it's an architect. So... You must develop excellent presentation skills, excellent sales skills, excellent uh, executive communication skills, executive presence. And here's the difference. Hi, my name's Mike. I'm a cloud security architect. Hi, I'm Mike Gibbs. I'm a cloud security architect. I'm here to help you. See, in the first case, nobody took me seriously. But in the second case, people did. You're going to have to have le good leadership skills because you're going to be leading large groups. 
You're going to have good consultation skills. And then you're going to have to be able to do some ROI modeling to show that the value of the technology, the security technology, is going to be mitigated by the, you know, protecting whatever the intellectual property is, protecting from brand damage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the skills to become a cloud security architect. I'm training a ton of them in my cloud architect career development program. Love to work with you too as well. But those are the skills. What type of questions are you going to be asked during an interview for a cloud security job? Well, I would ask you something like this. From the perimeter out, how would you secure a web application? Say, I need to know that you know that you'd use a content delivery network. And then you'd have a next generation uh, network load balancer to front end a couple of network load balancers. And I need to know you're probably going to use another network load balancer to front end a couple of IDS IPS systems, which you use for monitoring as secondary to the next generation firewalls. And then you might use an access control list and then a security group and then on the host, what are you going to do? You're going to disable unnecessary services. You're going to patch it. You're going to put some anti-malware protection. You're going to put some security group, security services, an extra host-based firewall. What kind of encryption are you going to use, et cetera, et cetera? So those would be the kind of things that I would ask. I'm not looking for a one-word answer. I'm looking to know that you know how to answer and design it. Those are what we would ask. Karthik. I have never configured anything in the last 25 years. Architects don't configure, architects don't code. So I do have all my students in the program configure at once. Why? So if somebody ever says, have you done this in here? You can say, yes, I have. But no, architects don't configure anything. That's the whole problem with certification training. It's the name of the site is how to configure. We design, present, and sell. We don't configure anything, so no. Um, we do need to know how the systems work, that how to configure them for us is an irrelevant skill, but we still need to say we can do it. So I make sure everybody can do it so they can say they did it. But no, the last time I configured anything was 2001 because I became an architect in 2001. Design, present, and sell. Do industry clients change cloud vendors? Sure they do. And what, in this case, what factors do we need to consider? Naga, what is the business problem we're trying to solve? Is the customer trying to increase revenue? Do you increase productivity? Are they trying to increase defects? Are they trying to improve the supply chain? I don't know what the business problem is. You got to look and analyze the business. Now, when we go from the network in the data center to the cloud, what are we doing? We're going from one network in the data center to the cloud to another network in the data center. So it depends what it is. If it's a lift and shift Naga, we can go from Azure to AWS in 10 minutes and nobody cares. It's nothing. If a company spent $50 million to refactor their application to be AWS called native, it might cost us $50 million to get out of AWS to go to Azure. So it depends on the architecture. It depends on the business needs. And no one can ask answer an architecture question without asking the first question, Mr. Customer, what business challenge are you looking for help with? That drives it. So it's kind of like this. This happens to be a $200 flashlight. Really good flashlight. It's carried by the same flashlight carried by the Navy SEALs. Why do I have it? Because if I drop it off a 10-story building, it's still going to work. It's so bright that I can find my cat that's a mile away. So yes, this was a $200 flashlight. It was worth it to me because my cat goes out at night. I call her, Cindy, Cindy, Cindy. She can't hear me. And then I shine this super bright light and she comes running because she knows I'm looking for her. So for me, this $200 flashlight's worth it. But if I wasn't trying to find my cat a half a mile away, I would get a $10 flashlight. So the business drives the needs. Would you buy a tractor trailer if you're trying to go zero to 60 in three seconds? Of course you wouldn't. You buy a Ferrari. So what drives the technology? What drives the mood? The business problem you're trying to solve. And that's why engineers often have a hard time becoming architects. And that's why it's often easier for non-engineers to become architects than engineers because the engineers want to know all the tech. The tech is the last part. If I wanted to sell you a car, I'd ask you what your needs are. How many people need to go in there? What speed do you need to go? Are you going to be driving in the left lane of the German Autobahn? Are you going to be driving on bumpy small roads? How, many, how much weight do you have to carry? Do you have to carry 10,000 kilograms? Or do you have to carry 200 kilogram people? That determines your architecture. It's never, 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 ever the tech. It's always the business. So if you ask a business question, then I can answer it. But I can't ask her a business problem with the tech thing. Wave Pete, Mike, I'm trying to be a cloud architect. What are the number of CSP platforms we should master? 
wave pad, you must master the cloud, the cloud, the cloud, not any cloud provider. As an architect, here's the thing. I'm going to design an architecture that needs a virtual machine. I'm going to design an architecture that needs a network load balancer. I'm going to design an architecture that needs a next generation firewall that I'm going to get from the marketplace from all the cloud providers. I'm going to create two private lines and I don't need to run BGP on it. Guess what? That's cloud. Now, if I taught you nothing other than this virtual machine, this kind of database to use, this kind of container, this kind of load balancer, you could work on any cloud everywhere every time and not even know the single name of a service. And here's why. You could literally do this. I like to take my data center architects and they say, Mike, I've been a network and data center architect for 20 years. Do I need your course? And I say, well, tell me this. Here's a chart right in front of you. And uh, I need 100 virtual machines with 120 cores and four terabytes of DRAM. I need a network load balance in front of it. I then need four servers with 64 cores and two terabytes of DRAM. And then I need these servers that do this. I give them this and say, Google it. Five minutes later, they say, Mike, it's an X1E.32XLG on AWS. And I said, how'd you find it? They said, you just told me I needed a virtual machine with 120 cores and four terabytes of DRAM. So I Googled it. So the key is way, Pat, if you know the network in the data center, you know all clouds, all clouds, all clouds, all clouds. So I need you to master the cloud. No, not any particular vendor. Now, here's how easy it is when you know the cloud. We wrote a book on passing the AWS exam. Now, way Pat, what I did is the following. I said to my, my co-author when I wrote that book, I said, if we wrote a good book on passing the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional exam, I'm going to use it to take the Google Professional Cloud Architect exam. And of course, my co-author laughed at me. He said, Mike, you're insane. I said, why am I insane? He said, it's a different cloud. And I said, wait. The tech is the same. So I did spend two days preparing for the, uh, is this the book? No, for the Google Professional Cloud Architect book exam. Here's what I did. I bought the Cybex book. Showed up. I read it on the Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, took the Google exam. That exam was so simple, it shut off in 45 minutes, and obviously I passed it because I answered all the questions. Why could I pass that exam in two days? Because I knew cloud. So it's not the number of cloud providers. I don't want you to learn 10. I want you to know the cloud. I want you to be an expert on that cloud. If I asked you to drive a car and you knew what a steering wheel was and an accelerator and a brake, you could drive any car, right? You could. So I want to train you to drive the cloud. Now, I'm not going to call this an elastic directional vector changer, elastic compute cloud. It's stupid. I'm going to call it a virtual machine. I'm going to strip off that elastic compute cloud marketing obfuscation. I'm going to skip, delete the compute engine instance obfuscation. obfuscation. I'm going to talk to it as the, the tech that it is. And here's the thing, WavePad. If I were to talk about an EC2 instance to my customer, they'd laugh me out of the room and not know what it is. If I tell my customer's chief information officer, we're going to implement these 10,000 VMs on AWS, they say, thank you, Mike. Thank you for speaking my language. And then they can call it an EC2 instance if they want, and it will be when it goes to AWS, but that's just the name of a service. So, you know, this says Adidas on it. If I had the same shirt and I branded Nike on it, and then after that I put Under Arm on it, it was the same shirt, it's the same shirt. So learn how to wear the shirt. Don't worry about the sticker that's on it. It's all the same. Get certified in one of the clouds, but know all the clouds. And you'll be good to go. How long do I need to study to become a cloud architect? And how lucrative can this big career be in developing countries like South Africa? How long do you need to study? It depends. So I say my average student in my program, if they've been working in tech for a while, it's about four months. If they've not been working in tech for a while, it's about eight months, six to eight months. So for, with regards to that, it's, uh, it's realistically speaking in that. How lucrative can this career be? Incredible. How about South Africa? Well, here's what I got to tell you. AWS is investing a lot in South Africa, as are several other cloud providers. The three countries in Africa where I see the most progression right now are South Africa, Nigeria, and Cameroon. We feel so strongly about this market. We hired our first employee in Cameroon. We love him. He's super smart and he's super great. So I see a lot of it. I see tremendous amounts of cloud architects and cloud engineering work coming to Africa. I have 500 students from Africa right now. And they're doing incredibly, incredibly, incredibly well. So I think this is a great career. I've got other students in South Africa. They're amazing. Just got some amazing students in Nigeria, Cameroon. This week, two of my three students that got hired are from Africa. 
My other student is not. They're from somewhere else. This is a career where there's cloud computing everywhere. And it's coming to my village in Greece. And soon it's coming to more villages in Africa. And here's why in the developing nations, I see so much cloud computing. So in normal environment, a normal data center, it's very capital intensive. You've got to have a lot of capital to build a data center. I've been involved in billion dollar data center builds. I mean, obviously it's a whole system, but you know, there's that. No. At the cloud, there's nothing to buy. And a lot of the cloud providers are, are basically giving people up to a year of either free or reduced discounted prices. So a person in a developing nation can start a business on the cloud that leverages the cloud, basically get almost free pricing for their first year, build the business, and by the time the prices go up the second year, they already have enough money to do it. So I see cloud architects, cloud engineers, and cloud computing being an incredible equalizer to the world, bringing prosperity and jobs all over. Now, the jobs right now are market-based in what they pay. Having said that, cost of living is different based on these markets as well. So I think the cloud architect career is wonderful. I'd love to have more students from South Africa. And whatever you do, whether you train with us or not, it's a great career. So make sure that you do it. But it's also, it's not just the tech. It's the leadership, sales skills, executive presence, et cetera. So go after your dreams. If this is something you want, I strongly encourage you to do it, and you'll do great. Lovely, lovely career. Marcus, once the customer makes the transformation, what will the cloud architect play? Um, so here's the thing. I work at the cloud provider. I go over to Bank of America. I design their architecture. Okay, Mike, go talk to Wells Fargo. When I'm done, Wells Fargo. Hey, Mike, go to China and talk to HSBC. So as soon as we're done one architecture, we go on to the next one. And then the next one. And then the next one. And then three years later, Bank of America says, hey, Mike. You told us to go multi-cloud, but we chose to go single cloud. We've had 10 outages, and now we want to go multi-cloud. And they're like, okay. And you go back, and you make a multi-cloud like you told them to do in the first place. So we go back. There's new technology, but we're, we're like a salesman. Sell something, sell something, sell something. Best description I can describe a cloud architect is a salesperson in a lab coat. You've got all the tech science knowledge, but you're still in sales. So you got a customer to customer to the next customer. Great question there, Marcus. Naga, when I hear RFC, I hear request for comment. So the customer is going to be asking for difference. They're going to be sending you a request for a proposal, request for query, or request for pricing, and you're going to respond to it. Now, if you work at the cloud provider, which most of us do, here's what we do. Hey, you over there in cloud security, I need you. Hey, you in databases, I need you. Now, how easy it is to do that, Naga? Well, if you've got executive communication skills, it's excellent. But if you don't have executive communications leadership skills, you can't. So that's why you have to be an executive for this job. Because you're going to have to be able to go to your VPs and your SVPs. You might even need to go to the CEO, depending upon the size of the company, and say, I need these 50 engineers for the next six months. And that means you're going to need to sell it to all these people to give them to you. Now, when you're designing security, Naga, you're going to look at it and say, hey, wait. I need a firewall structure. Hmm, should I call? Well, I'll call Cisco. I'll call Palo Alto. I'll call Flarkton and Checkpoint, and they'll help me design them. So, yes, you're going to reach out to everybody. You're not going to ever do something on your own. This is not a tech job. I mean, it is a tech job, but it's not a tech job. This is a cross between an, arch, an executive and a technology professional. So with every architecture, I ask the customer about their business. First thing I do. Ask about their business. And then after that, I take their business requirements and go back to my team and say, help me with this. Really, I'm the leader or the manager of all the smart people resources. Most likely, my company has all the resources I need. But if they don't, I'll call the external vendors. So yeah, we'll reach out to everybody. That's the whole point. That's why you can't be a techie for this job. That's why you need to be the executive so you know who and how to speak to, communicate with, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll do great. Chris, if you want to go to the next one. But here's the thing. You're not going to get HLD documents. The customer is going to say, I have a problem. And you're going to have to design the design. They don't give it to you. You design it. Drake, Carol, I know there's a lot in tech we need to know, but what would you be capable of building design if you finish your Azure Solution Architect course? 
wait, are you talking about our Azure Solution Architect course or are you talking about our Cloud Architect course? Our Azure Solution Architect is training. That's not, it's training on the Azure Cloud. Certification training is not gonna get anybody a job ever, but it will teach you the Azure solutions. It will teach you the names of the Azure services, how those services work, and it will prepare you for a certification exam. Again, training to become a cloud architect and training to be certified are different. Why do we do certifications? Because you have to have one certification on your resume to help you get the interview. That's it. It's a one-week boot camp to help you get certified, to help you get an interview. But it's not our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. It's not going to get you a job. It'll be one of those things you need to do. And it'll give you about 10% of what you need to do to get a job. Completely free, which is a lot. But it's a certification training course, and no certification training course is going to get somebody hired. It takes us 500 hours to train a Cloud Architect. 200 hours or so is on the leadership skills, sales skills, executive presence, communication skills. 300 or so is in architecture, design, et cetera. That's what it takes. I can't do that in a boot camp that's going to be live, but I can help you get certified. I can help teach you about the cloud. I can teach you a little bit about block storage, object storage, file storage, and networking along the way. And I can take a certification course and make it 60% more career related than it should be and still pass it off as a certification course. But that's not our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. If you want to get a job, that's what you need. You could take our certification course, great. And that'll give you a lot, but you still need to learn the networking, the data center things, and then you'll still need the business acumen, communication, sales, emotional intelligence, executive presence training. That's what it takes to get an architect. So what will you be capable of doing? You'll be capable of, of understanding all the services on the Azure cloud, and you'll learn how to configure them, which is exactly what certification is related. Ron Miller, good morning, Mike. I just signed up for your career development program. You're very excited. Thank you, Mike. I'm very excited to be working with you. I hope we can get you into the first class at noon today. Normally, I would be teaching, but I have a special treatment for everybody, especially since I'm a little bit under the weather today. I have my favorite application architect talking today about APIs and API gateways, and it's really good stuff. So he's an expert. He's got 20 years on application architecture. And we, it was one of the things I wanted to bring in. So I've got Angelo from my team who's going to speak today. He's amazing, amazing, amazing. Try to get to class today. Normally Fridays are leadership days, but 2% under the weather. And I've got you know, one of my favorite architects coming in today. So it's going to be a special day. Please try to get to the 12 o'clock class. Premise, we teach you as part of the program, we help optimize your LinkedIn profile and your resume because if you don't do that and you look like an engineer, no player will be interested in you. So we have to teach you how to make the right resume and the right LinkedIn profile. That's part of the program. We also teach you how to negotiate a higher salary as part of the program. It's not enough just to teach you the tech. It's not enough just to teach you the leadership. We have to teach you how to interview and we have to teach you how to build your brand. Because, Pram, I want 10 people coming to you each day offering you a job. And that way you can choose to go on which interviews you want. And that's going to take us optimizing your LinkedIn profile and your CV. And we do both as part of the program. In regards to the earlier interview discussion, would recommend going along with the company's interview process if it already includes five interviews before you consider for the role. I don't know what you mean by that. I've, been in, I've worked for companies where they do 20 interviews for a position. The better, best companies will, will, will literally spend 20 plus interviews for a position. Now, here's the thing, Carol, 747. If you're really good, they'll inter it might be different. So Cisco typically does 20 interviews for any position. And WorldCom typically does 20 interviews for a position. Carol, I went to WorldCom. I was interviewing, speaking to the hiring manager. And before I even left him, he said, I'm going to hire you right now. But I wowed him. When I went to Cisco, um, my wife actually had sent a e resume to Cisco, and somehow they called me. And when Cisco called me and I spoke to them, I said, well, look, you know, I will be in New York City tomorrow and the day after that, but I'm going to go back. I, they called me. I was in England. I was going home for three days to see my wife, and then I was on the way to Dubai. I said, I'll be in the U.S. for the next two days, and I'll be in New York. They hired me within two days. So the key is everything's going to be multiple rounds, unless you're so good. They're like, oh my God, I've got to hire Cairo 747 before he goes to my competitor because for me, he's an asset. My competitor, he's a weapon against me. So it depends how good you are. But 
every interview is going to include four or five rounds for an average person, meaning average good. So, yeah, I'd keep doing it. I'd keep going, but I would not go in an interview until I was ready to be hired. Because if you're not ready to be hired and you go in an interview, all that's going to happen is the company is going to say, I don't ever want to talk to this person ever again. And it's going to mess with you psychologically. and You're not going to learn it. So don't part in a bridge. Wait till you're ready and then go get hired. Quick strikes. Are there any specific certs like there are for architects? Well, quick strike 21. There's no such thing as an architect cert. None. Zero. Except for telegraph and nobody knows what it means from a customer perspective. So there's no architect certs. All of these certifications that are out there are cloud engineering certifications. The AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional is an engineering certification, regardless of the name. The Azure Solution Architect Expert is a, is a cloud engineering one. Actually, not cloud engineering. It's more cloud admin. And the uh, Google Professional Cloud Architect is also an admin job, which is closer to engineering than architecture. So there's that. What other certifications are good for cloud engineers? Networking certifications like the CCNA and CCNP. The VMware certified professionals that are expert at virtualization, that teach virtualization, data center certifications like Red Hat, they talk about like the Red Hat certified engineer, et cetera. They all build an engineer's profile. A Kubernetes certification could be okay too, but Quick Strike 20, remember, these are jobs that are built by knowledge, not certifications. Knowledge, not certifications. We have to define the difference between a professional job and an admin help desk kind of job. Entry-level jobs benefit from certification, name of the service, and how to configure that service. Professional jobs like architects and engineers need a professional, which means a professional body of knowledge. And that's not covered in certification. So those certifications I mentioned can help you get an interview, but I promise they'll never, ever, ever help you get a job. But they will help you get an interview. Knowledge of Linux, knowledge of Terraform, knowledge of operating systems, knowledge of configuration, Knowledge of cloud services and networking, that's going to get you the job, not the certification. That'll only get you an interview. Join us on Thursday for the next How to Get Your Free cloud, First Cloud Architect Job. It's free. You can ask lots of questions on Zoom. It'll be fun. Karthik, nobody's born with design skills. Nobody's even born with language. In fact, the average human would be dead in the first 24 hours if people didn't take care of us. We're not born with anything. We learn things. I didn't know how to practice medicine in my youth. I didn't know how to design a cloud architecture in my youth. I didn't even know what design was in my youth. These are all skills that are trained. And that's the problem. Some people think that you should start at the bottom and learn somebody else's job like help desk. And then when you're done that, after you're done help desk, then maybe take an admin job and then maybe take a mailroom job and then maybe move into an engineer job for a decade and then become an architect. And 20 years later, you got to your goal. Karthik, I got people there with me for six months and never worked in tech before. They're working as architects for AWS, big banks and other companies. So we are taught these skills. Nobody's born with anything. Humans are born with no access. Now a cat can survive on its own. The cat can hunt as a baby. The cat's got instincts. Humans don't even have a single instinct. Research into psychological sociology. A human will die within 24 hours if it's not taken care of by people. A cat will survive. So we have to be taught all these skills. No one's born with them. And anybody that doesn't have specific design training will never, ever, ever get hired in this position. They're taught. Nobody's born an airplane pilot. Nobody's born a doctor. And nobody's born a cloud architect. Chris, you can go to the next one. Good question, though, Carter. Addy, we tell everybody that we don't believe the Certified Solution Architect Associate is good enough for anything. We tell everybody that the basic intro course is the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional. It is a basic, 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 basic program compared to what we're actually talking about in the professional of a cloud architect or a cloud engineer. That, in our mind, is an intro to a junior level cloud certification course, the AWS Advanced Certified Solution Architect Professional. But now I'm going to tell you this. AWS has hired some of our people that have zero certification. AWS has hired some of our people at the cloud practitioner. And AWS has hired some of our people that have nothing in the cloud but have CCIEs. The key is knowledge, 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 knowledge. And if your resume and portfolio looks good enough, you're there. Now, let's back it out a little bit. If you've got experience, you might not need any certifications. But if you're brand new, the certifications can help make up for gaps on your resume to help you get the interview. We say never do more associates. And if you're going to do an associate, do it on the way to the professional. 
but don't do multiple associates. So that's another thing. So I want to explain to you why. When a hiring manager sees an associate certification, they see a junior level person that we need to spend $100,000 to train. Almost good enough to know something, but not really. At the professional level, we're like, oh, that's a paper AWS certified solution architect professional, which means they still don't know anything, but they either were really good memorizers and bought a copy of the exam and memorized the questions and answers really good, or they read the book, they had the intellectual capacity to pass the exam. I know they don't need it, know anything, but wow, they're smart enough to pass the exam and that's good. So there's that, but it's only to get you the interview. So keep it that way. But Abby, look at it this way. The AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional is about 500 pages of reading to pass it. A Cisco Certified Internet Expert is about 75,000 pages of reading. A CCNA, which is an associate course, is 2,000 pages of reading. An AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional is 500. So I realize how basic an intro that actually is. A CCNP, which is a professional networking certification, is between 8 and 10,000 pages of reading compared to 500 for this. So... The AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, in our mind, is an intro junior level certification. And that's the key. Employers know these certifications don't prepare you to do the job, but they say, okay, the person might know something, so let's at least talk to them. And if you do good on these job interviews and you have no background, they'll hire you right there on the spot. If you don't do good on the interview, what they're going to say is, I'm sorry, you don't have experience. I'm sorry you don't have experience means you're not competent and I don't want to talk to you. I can't hire you and I don't want to tell you that I don't like you. So I'm not saying that's you that doesn't have experience, but once you get that interview, it means the hiring manager is willing to hire you. Hiring managers don't have the time to interview people they're not hiring, but we hiring managers don't like to tell people they didn't do good in an interview. So we say things like, come back when you have more experience, only if the interview went bad. So yes, that certification, we recommend the professional to help you get the interview. But it's only to get you the interview. It's the knowledge that's contained in our program that's going to get you hired. And that knowledge is way, way, way outside of anything in certification. So we, we skipped this one earlier. You've already talked with this one about what specifically he yeah. wanted. Uh, but I brought it up because of the practitioner part. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that came in only because of a certification name. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> Cairo 747, I don't know what a practitioner is. What practitioner really means is you're practicing like medicine or law, and you're going to keep learning it until you get better and you never become an expert. That's what practitioner means. Now, there's a name of a certification called a practitioner. For anybody outside the U.S., we find it okay. For anybody in the U.S., the U.K., or Canada, we say skip any certification with the word practitioner in it because it's too basic an intro. For people in the developing world that are getting a test for free, we tell them to do the cloud practitioner, for example, and then skip the certified solution architect associate, which is like the same test and exam, and go straight to the certified solution architect professional and uh, use that 50% discount from passing the uh, um, cloud practitioner. But practitioner just means doer. And you just asked me about how to be an architect, which is how to design. So realistically speaking, the architects need the system design skills. The engineers need the building skills. There's no such thing as a practitioner. That's just the name of the certification. So let's just skip that one completely. We told you how to become a cloud security architect like you asked. On Thursday next week, please join us for the free How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. You're going to have a great time. Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, you know, how to leverage your life experience to get hired. We'll tell you the hiring manager's perfect dream hire. We'll tell you everything you need to learn. We'll tell you the certifications you need on your portfolio. And uh, we'll tell you how to skip HR. You know, I've got about 15 minutes. If you've got any last questions, please ask them now. And uh, please ask them now. And otherwise, you know, please join us on our completely free Azure Solution Architect Bootcamp in June. Tell your friends, it's going to be fun. We're going to cover Azure technologies, how they work, how to use them, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be good, good, good fun. And also, we've got a mock interview on the 25th. I strongly encourage you. The whole point of doing this is to get hired. And the gateway to getting hired is, guess what? The interview. So 
register for the mock interview session. We want to do everything we can to do to help you get cloud hired. And guess what? So that's even completely free. So join us. Well, Hamid, this week I had one person get hired as a cloud architect, which is even harder to get as a cloud engineer, and he doesn't have a college degree. So no. Now, Muhammad, I'm going to tell you this. About 30% of companies will not hire you if you don't have a college degree. But about the rest of the 70% will. So no, you don't need one. But realize 7% will hire you. Big cloud provider, sure. Big company, sure. Every once in a while, you run into a goofy hiring manager. And if you run into the goofy hiring manager that cares about your degree, then they won't hire you. Now, I'm also going to tell you this, Muhammad. You can get a cloud engineer job without a degree. But once you start wanting to move into management and leadership positions, you, you're definitely going to want to get a degree because it's going to make a difference there. But to become all the way up to a senior cloud engineer, no, you won't need a degree in most cases. But you will be needing a degree to move up into management. But reality is I'd rather see your degree in, in uh, business or something good like that. And the reason is that's going to promote more management. So... Get a focus degree. I wouldn't. I generally t don't tell people don't get an English degree because you know, there's nothing you can do with it. I love history, but I wouldn't advise anybody to get a history degree either unless they want to teach. There's nothing to do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, Pat, I will eventually join your program, but right now you're not financially able. You're working with free resources right now. Besides soft skills, what should I keep in mind until learning the program, the cloud architecture program? Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. The average cloud architect earns $600 a day, and a good one earns about $1,200 a day. So every day you're not on my program, not graduating, my program is costing you a fortune, like $12,000 a month. So I'd find a way to use the program, even if it wasn't the live version, the non-live version, which is uh, $400 with a coupon. So that's what I'd be doing. Because if you try and learn soft skills on your own, it's going to cost you three to $10,000. There's no other way around it. Emotional intelligence training is three to five thousand dollars. CXO relevant training, oh my god, I spent thirty thousand dollars on that, as did Cisco. Sales skills to learn how to sell cost me a good five to ten thousand dollars. ROI modeling training, which you know was part of the MBA program, cost me about a hundred thousand uh, dollars. So the leadership skills, you know, they cost me a tremendous amount to develop. So, you know. These skills that I'm telling you are really, really, really expensive skills to learn. In fact, they're so expensive, they're beyond the financial reach of most people. And that's why my peers are yelling at me every day, Mike, why aren't you charging $50,000 for your course? You're getting people $150,000 jobs, $100,000 jobs in six months to eight months. You could be charging $50,000 to $100,000 for your course. And I say, I don't do it. This is not really a business. It's my hobby. It's my passion. I want to get the world cloud hired. So these are real expensive skills to align with. I wish there was a way around it. But the only people that can teach executive presence, generally as people, are executives that earn three to $500,000 a year. They're the only ones that know. So these are expensive skills to learn. So, you know, with our payment plan, you know, it's $280 a month for the live class. And it's $148 a month for people for three months straight that can't do this. So if the average cloud architect earns $600 a day in the U.S., and $1,200 for a good one. And you get through our thing for $148 for three months straight, and you're in our program for five months, six months, you're hired. We've changed your life financially forever. So, you know, if it was me, I'd be focusing on taking the training to get out of the bad financial situation. So, way past when I was younger, I was very poor. In fact, when I was in college, here's how I got through I went to school from seven to three. I worked 3.30 to 11 as a firefighter paramedic. I worked 11 to 7, three days per week as a firefighter paramedic. And then I worked a 16-hour day on Saturday and Sunday to do it. Now, that was what I did when I was young. That wasn't smart. In my MBA program, I said, wait, this thing can add $100,000 to my salary. And it did inside of a year, along with the other training. I financed it. I paid it back in like six months. So for me, the key was, you know, what is the opportunity cost of your time? If you're losing $12,000 per month, which is effectively what you're losing by trying to take it slow, if it takes you an extra six months to join my program, you lost $72,000. So I, best advice I can give you is, you know, take our course. Or 
Go find yourself a $3,000 speech class for the week. Go find yourself a $5,000 executive presence course because you're going to need it. Go find yourself an emotional intelligence course and get it. I don't care where you get it. I just want you to get it. I just want you to get hired. And what I did is I took the $50,000 and I shrunk it down to as cheap as it can be. Where you get it is where you get it. But get those skills. It doesn't have to be with us. There's other people to teach them. They're just very expensive. And I paid Mike, a quarter million dollars for these skills. I just put it in the chat box too, but I wanted to point out that the, uh, so we mentioned that with the current discount and the payment plans, the basic program would be $148 a month. Mm -hmm. The basic program includes recordings of our live classes. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're truly not financially able to absorb that, that the price of the live program, you still get the benefit of being able to watch the classes not maybe not being able to take part in them, but being able to watch the classes. And so I just wanted to make sure we pointed that out to WavePad also. Yeah. So that again, the with the with our current discount that I put in the chat box, it it would be $148 a month on a payment plan for three months or $280, depending on which which program we went with. Um, so I just I wanted to piggyback on that there. And then I've got a couple of questions I'm going to pop up that are the same question, but okay. two different programs, but okay. the same question. Sure. That's Chris, my chief operating officer. He's involved in all the business part of these things. If you join our cloud engineer program, you'll be in our program for up to 12 months or until you get hired. Is there a time limit to finish the cloud architect class? We let people stay in our program for up to 12 months or until they get hired. And the reason we do that is nobody needs 12 months to get hired. Everybody gets hired. But by giving somebody 12 months, we can pretty much say 100% of everybody gets hired as long as they do the work because we give everybody so much time. We are not obsessed with how long it takes to finish. All I care is that you guys get hired. That's all that matters. We'd love to work with you, Pat. I'm just trying to be honest and sincere. That's the only way that I can get you the training you need at the lowest cost possible. Alonzo, come on, the value is tremendous with watching. Seriously, it is, because you're going to do the same projects, turn it over Slack, and we're still going to give you the same feedback. All I care is that you get hired in the end. And if you ever wanted to upgrade, we would do that too. We just want to know you get hired. Rami Romeo, I'm a beginner. I want to learn the cloud to see if it's possible to just get a Udemy course. No, you will never get hired on a Udemy course. Rami, what we did, and how, here's how I can guarantee that. Before we started to build, use, to produce this course, I did the following. I was initially going to assist my friend get his first cloud and architect job. And what I did was as following. I told him that I would spend two to four hours with him coaching him and teaching him cloud architect skills. And I bought him the three top selling courses. Two of those courses were on Udemy. Another one of those courses was in the guy's own name. Anyway, so I bought him these three courses. And after three days, the kid calls me and says, hey, Mike. I've set up an EC2 instance in S3 Bucket, but I don't even know what it is. And they said, no, it's not possible. It couldn't be. So here's what we did. I watched those videos in horror. I then told them, look, Nathan, here's what we're going to do. Nathan Bonds, we're going to write a book on passing the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional. We're going to strip out 10 pages and give it away for free, which we did as an associate book. We then started producing free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate courses. We popped out a free CCNA course. We popped out a free AWS Advanced Networking course. And now we're giving you a free um, uh, Azure Solution Architect Expert. But here's the thing. The certifications are the name of a service and how to configure that service. These jobs require so much more than the things that are outside of the certification. Here, when do we not use the stuff in certification, which is at least 60% of the time? How do we determine what to build for the customer? That's based upon the customer's business requirement. Do we need, are we an architect in the system design where we need business acumen, sales skills, communication skills, emotional intelligence, et cetera? Or are we an engineer where we're going to need to know Python skills and Terraform skills and bash cell scripting skills and Linux skills and engineering skills? And none of that, none of that, none of that is covered in Udemy courses. So unfortunately, I don't see Udemy as a place to get a job ever, but I do see Udemy as an excellent way to learn how to build it, to learn how to you know, clean your TV, to learn some hobbyist things. You want to be a better biker and you want to do that, to learn a little bit of other tech skills, but not for a career, just to improve self-improvement. I think Udemy is excellent for that. Excellent. It gives you the opportunity to get accessible training at a low cost.
It's excellent, but it's not going to build your career. That takes some professional, not, nothing you can find on your domain. And Randy, I interviewed a thousand people before I created this course that were multi, that were certified with multiple certifications on AWS. Most had the AWS certified solution architect professional, and I couldn't find anybody that was employable. I interviewed a thousand, and that's why I created this course. And now my students get hired every day of the week. You're more than welcome, Drake. I completely agree with Alonzo. The value increases so much uh, when you're a part of the community and you're working with people all over the world that are experts and working together to get to a common goal. You're more than welcome, Prem. So it's, it's been fun seeing you today. If you want to get your first Cloud Architect job, please register for the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. We'll do everything we can to help you get your first Cloud Architect job. The link is in the description below on the chat box, along with some coupon codes from my team because we want to help you get a cloud hired as cheaply as possible. Please join us for the free Azure Solution Architect Expert Bootcamp in June. The link is in the description below. And please join us in the free interview coaching session on May 25th. It's going to be really, really fun. The link is in the description below. I've had a great time sharing the morning with you. Hope I've answered your questions. I'll be back on Monday to ask for more questions. Take care, everyone. And it was so nice to speak to you today.